First of all, again, welcome to everyone for being a part of the Marco Island Historical Society Zoom in series. Um, this has been a very different year for all of us. And so for the Historical Society, it meant really changing how we approach our programming. In the past, most of our programming, if not all, was done face to face. And we were fortunate to have Dr. McDonald visit us and, and do a great face to face program for us in the past. But with, um, with the pandemic, the world changed. And so we moved into the virtual world. And now here we are. Um, we are still very committed to staying connected with our members, our supporters, uh, our donors. We're committed to making new friends and of course, staying very connected to our history. So um, we're very pleased that we have this opportunity to still continue to offer really high quality programming to, to everyone who, um, who is a part of us. I wanna tell you just a little bit about Dr. McDonald. Um, she is a public historian and an adjunct professor at Stetson University and Indian River State College. Uh, she's a native Floridian. I didn't, there are very few of those, it seems, these days. So we're lucky to have a native Floridian with us. Um, Dr. McDonald gives presentations on a variety of topics in Florida history um, with the Florida Humanities. And her first book, Marjorie Harris Carr, Defender of Florida's Environment, was published by the University Press uh, of Florida in 2014. So Dr. McDonald's going to tell us a bit about Marjorie Carr, who used the power of the pen and grassroots activism to celebrate old Florida and protect Florida's wildlife and wild places, preserving many of North Central Florida's ecological treasures. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. McDonald and welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. You do a great job with the virtual. And I have to say, I love that lamp. I have lamp envy if that's a thing. And uh, it was so fun to visit last year and I have my Key Marco cat pen with me for good luck. Uh, so thank you for inviting me back and welcome to everybody who's here. Uh, this is a, a good attendance for a virtual program. Uh, nice to see Lisa Lennox from Florida Humanities in attendance as well. Um, I'm going to start things off by sharing my screen, and I have a PowerPoint that I created um, using images from Marjorie Carr's family. Her daughter Mimi, who's the eldest of the Carr's five children, um, allowed me to make multiple trips to her home uh, to scan images. And there are also images from the Matheson History Museum, uh, some from the State Archives of Florida, so um, I hope these images help bring this history to life for you. Um, so in this, this is one of my favorite images, it's cropped, showing Marjorie Harris when she was 21, uh, holding a blue indigo snake and um, just having a, a grand time. Um, so we're going to get going and find out a little more about her life. Uh, Marjorie, like many of you, was not born in Florida. In fact, of Florida's three Marjories, Marjorie, Marjorie uh, Stoneman Douglas, Marjorie Canan Rawlings and Marjorie Harris Carr, uh, none were actually born here, but they moved here and really embraced the state. And part of why Marjorie Harris Carr became so committed to saving Florida's environment was that her parents were naturalists and teachers. So you can see here Charles Harris looking dapper and Clara Haynes with her lovely graduation lace uh, uh, doily around her neck. Um, Charles was actually educated in, in law at Dartmouth, but chose to give up what would have been a luc uh, lucrative career in the law to educate Italian immigrant children in Boston. Um, on a whim, almost, the uh, Carr family, the Harris family rather, moved from Boston to rural Southwest Florida to tiny Bonita Springs where they purchased an orange grove. So this was one example of people who came to Florida representing that Florida dream, the idea being you get an orange grove and life will be easy in Florida. Um, here you can see an image from over a century ago of Charles Harris teaching his daughter Marjorie how to identify seashells at Sanibel Island. Um, and again, this is one of many images that uh, Mimi Carr allowed me to scan. So this is an unusual window into Florida, right? Um, if you think about it, Many children's introduction to going out in Florida, right, and traveling might be to go to Disney World. But in the case of Marjorie Harris, she went to Florida's rivers and streams, 
and learned about the flora and fauna and her naturalist teacher parents taught her how to identify them. This was the house Marjorie grew up in, in Bonita Springs. It's a cracker style house, but her father actually built it by hand. And um, she was uh, constantly out with her parents in nature. Here you could see her um, enjoying the products of a successful fishing trip to the Imperial River. And here you could see a different side of nature that Marjorie witnessed. This is um, a, an alligator skin. Now, Jack Davis, who wrote the biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, which is also really a biography of the Everglades, wrote that by the 1880s in Florida, 2.5 million alligator skins had been harvested. He compared this to the destruction that took place at the same time out west with buffalo. So this was one example of uh, beautiful rural Florida's uh, natural environment being devastated that was something Marjorie grew up with. She later said in an oral history interview that as a child, she watched the orange glow of the Everglades burning as the land was cleared for agriculture. So this moved her. Um, her parents would take her on drives around Southwest Florida where turpentining was going on. And when the um, process of taking the sap out of the trees and uh, to the point that the trees were, uh, were, were, were no longer capable of life, right? And that these trees were not replanted. That was the message that her parents gave her. And she thought something should be done, right? To protect Florida. Um, this is uh, Chiquita, a wild cracker horse that her family caught on the Kissimmee Prairie. So this is a descendant of the horses that um, Spaniards brought with them when they established a colony, the first colony in the present day United States, Florida, La Florida. So if you look carefully at the picture, you can see Marjorie's hair was cropped short. Uh, her pants were rolled up and keep in mind, there were still laws against women wearing pants in the workforce uh, as recently as the mid 1980s, right? R company rules. So here she is, pants, short cropped hair, and poor thing had a really thick Boston accent. And this was rural Southwest Florida. You can imagine this horse was probably her only friend. Marjorie, uh, Marjorie attended the Bonita School, it was the only school at the time. Now there were fewer than 1 million residents in Florida at the time Marjorie Harris moved and moved to Florida and grew up here. Um, so this was the only school that went up to the eighth grade. You can see Marjorie is the only girl in the bottom row. Um, so when it was time to go to high school, the family had to make a tough decision. They left their home in Bonita Springs and moved to Fort Myers, which was still so small that there wasn't even a bridge yet going across to the beach. Um, and Marjorie had to find a new home for her horse. Um, Tragedy struck when Marjorie was only 15. I think you could see it in this senior year photo from 1932 from Fort Myers High School. Marjorie looks beautiful, but also somewhat haunted. When she was 15, her father, Charles Harris, died suddenly of pneumonia. Now this was a few months shy of when he would have qualified for a pension for his teaching. The family had some money in a couple bank accounts uh, that the banks actually closed due to um, the bank failures of the Great Depression. So Marjorie's mother uh, went back to teaching. She moved to Sanibel and taught at a one-room schoolhouse. And Marjorie, more than anything, her, her daughter Mimi Carr later said, more than anything, Marjorie wanted to go to college. Um, now, options for attending college in the early 1930s were somewhat limited if you were a woman. Um, in the state of Florida, there was only one option if you were white, and that was Florida State College for Women. Black women and black men attended what is now FAMU in Tallahassee. And then also at the University of Florida in Gainesville, that would be open to white men. Now, beyond those confines, women's, um, women's role in society was still somewhat in flux. So this picture of a book that was very popular went through multiple editions in the late 19th century titled Sex in Education, A Fair Chance for the Girls uh, by Dr. Edward Clark 
sounds like it's uh, in, in favor of women's education, particularly at college. However, the author, Dr. Clark, made the case in his book that higher education was bad for women's health. That in fact, when women spend so much time in college thinking and reading and discussing big ideas, that the blood is literally sucked up out of their ovaries and into their head and they become sterile. In addition, in his book, he referred to a case of a woman who experienced death by college, even though he wasn't present at the autopsy. Now, what does this mean, this type of prescriptive literature where you see an argument against something, in this case, against women going to college? What it means it, is that women were going to college in greater numbers than ever. After uh, the Civil War, women started to attend college in great numbers. Now I see someone has raised a hand. Let's see here. I'm, I'm failing. I'm failing as an instructor at the moment. Let's see, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a moment to see what the question, um, is there a, a question? No questions. I did see a raised hand. If, if anyone has a question, you can put it in the Q&A and it will be monitored throughout the presentation. So this is actually a good opportunity to mention that. I should have said that at the start. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Aha, a question. It was just a chat, okay. Um, all right, well, in the chat, I see early handmaiden's tales. That's a good way of putting it, right? So the idea of controlling women's, not only their biology, but their access to education based on their biology. All right, you get a gold star. Thank you, Carol, for an excellent point. We're going to go back to the screen share and take a look what comes after this, this debate over, over women's proper place in college. Um, at Cornell University, we see an example of a laundry lab. Laundry labs were actually popular at universities across the United States. Uh, when I was telling one of my classes about this once, uh, Male student raised his hand and asked if he could get credit for Laundry Lab today. Sadly, it is no longer offered for college credit. However, this was part of a larger push to funnel students, female students who are interested in science into euthenics or domestic science, right? Or home economics. The point here would be that um, on the one hand, there were some advantages for women because they be could become faculty members in home economics, um, where the principles of scientific management would be applied to homemaking. So for instance, learning the most efficient ways to, con uh, to do laundry at Laundry Lab. But of course, the downside was that women faculty members were not hired outside home economics, and that women who were interested in science were encouraged to go in that one direction only. Well, Marjorie Harris had been interested in zoology from a young age. Um, luckily for her, at Florida State College for Women, instead of the laundry lab, we see here pictured the chemistry lab. So um, I see there's something in the Q&A. Oh, not, not a question. All right, Rebecca, good to see you. Uh, Rebecca is, is um, very active uh, in a lot of nature-based uh, pages and Florida history-based pages um, on Facebook. Uh, so good to see you today. So back to the chemistry lab. One thing that made Florida State College for Women unique was that of all the seven state Southern colleges for women, plus one in Oklahoma, only Florida State for, uh, College for Women offered a traditional liberal arts path. So women had a choice between the more traditional, more finishing school approach to college and a solid liberal arts education. In fact, Florida State College for Women offered such a strong program in liberal arts that it got the alpha charter in the state of Florida for Phi Beta Kappa ahead of the University of Florida. Um, I'm gonna take another look at the Q&A. Alligators, tarpons, sponges, egrets, and other birds, to name a few, were almost decimated. Thank goodness for defenders of the environment. How were these near decim decimation able to occur? Thank you, Karen, for that good question. Uh, another gold star to you. Um, in another talk I give on Florida's female pioneers, that's something I look at, which is 
uh, the women, uh, in particular women of Florida, who actually um, pushed to open Audubon Society chapters, where despite the fact that men such as John Muir have gotten credit, right, for um, saving the earth, it was, the women were the foot soldiers of the conservation uh, environment movement, and they were the ones who educated other women by working with women's clubs, for instance, and garden clubs to get the word out, or in the case of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, by using her column in the Miami Herald um, to write about the dangers of wearing parts of birds and whole dead birds on their hats. But that's the subject for another talk. Let's get back to Marjorie Carr for today. Here's Marjorie Harris in her graduation regalia, regalia from 1936. A very different look on her face compared to her 1932 high school graduation photo. She was a member of Phi Beta Kappa, a charter member of the Florida Academy of Sciences and a member of the Sigma Psi Honor, Science Honor Society. And she wanted to go to graduate school at uh, Cornell, which had the top ornithology program. And her goal was to work with whole live birds. However, the director of the program, Arthur Allen, told her point blank that women were not welcome in the field. So for the moment, her dream of going to graduate school had to be put on the back burner. However, because this was the New Deal era, there were new opportunities and new challenges for women such as Marjorie Harris who were interested in science. Marjorie became the first fem uh, female federal wildlife technician. She was hired as a biologist at the Wallaca National Fish Hatchery. Now, fish hatcheries have that old fashioned conservation mindset with the idea that Nature is a set of resources to be preserved to, for the use of humans, right? Nonetheless, in addition to um, the fish hatchery activities, the Civilian Conservation Corps, another New Deal organization, built an aviary at the fish hatchery. So here we see the, the different ponds, different pools to raise fish to be reintroduced into Florida's streams. And here we see the aviary. So in fact, Marjorie Harris was able to work with birds as she wanted to in graduate school. One thing she noticed was that the quail had a common um, illness. She thought they probably just had mites, uh, but she couldn't tell because there wasn't um, uh, a microscope at the fish hatchery. So she asked her boss if she could go to the University of Florida to use their lab equipment to test her hypothesis. Her boss said, no, you're going to have to do that here. You can't do that on the company dime. You know, you, you can't take any, any field trips to UF. So on her own at night after working all day, uh, Marjorie drove to Gainesville and she walked into the all-male University of Florida biology department where the graduate st students saw a 21-year-old, you know, science honors graduate with a box of sick quail and uh, pretty much all the male students uh, fell in love, or at least in lust with her. Horton Hobbs went to his good friend Archie Carr and told him he had seen the loveliest woman he'd ever met in his life. Well, um, Archie got all spruced up, went down to the biology department at night um, to ostensibly work on his dissertation, met Marjorie, and from all accounts, it was love at first sight. Marjorie and Archie Carr uh, would maintain a marriage for 50 years and they had five children together. And through Archie, Marjorie was able to blend raising a family with pursuing science in a time when women were not welcome in the field. Now, so one of the great loves that Marjorie was introduced to during her time at Wallaca was Archie Carr. The other was the Ocklawaha River. In this historic postcard from the Matheson History Museum, um, it, the, the title is Romantic Ocklawaha River. And it was romantic, right? This was a still relatively unspoiled piece of wild Florida in a part of Florida that by sheer luck had not been developed at this point in time. This is 1936. Previous to this, snowbirds came uh, from the north in, from January through April to the Ocklawaha, to these specially designed steamers to see the, the river both at night and at day. So you can see here, the caption says, the illuminated Ocklawaha forest, a weirdly beautiful radiance. 
I love the reflection of the Hiawatha, uh, which was the last of the Heartline steamers. Um, and if you look carefully, again, you can see a torch, a giant torch at the top, which would light up the uh, flora and fauna at night. And what people did was shoot at them. People particularly like to shoot at alligators and to see what would happen. Well, what happened was, of course, the alligators died. Uh, we saw that already with uh, an earlier picture. This picture shows the University of Florida. This is one of the two original uh, buildings on campus, academic buildings, Science Hall. It is now the Department of History. This is where I got my PhD. And this is where um, Marjorie Harris met Archie Carr. Well, she did use the lab equipment and she determined that her theory was right about the mites uh, affecting the quail. She went back to the Wallaca fish hatchery to report her findings. Um, a colleague heard her speaking and he took credit for her work. So um, Marjorie complained to the boss. The boss fired Marjorie. The problem here, in addition to losing her job was that Marjorie and Archie had developed a whirlwind uh, courtship. And this is the depression, right? Archie could not afford to marry her and support a wife. He made only $40 a month and he had everything in his budget worked out down to the last cigarette that he would roll to save money. Uh, he asked Marjorie if she would be comfortable working as a, science, uh, as a secretary um, to bring in some money so that they could you know, um, uh, be married and live together. But Marjorie wanted to remain a scientist and there weren't any secretary positions open. Uh, and the lowest level science positions in the biology department were already filled by uh, Archie and his fellow graduate students. So Archie pulled some strings. He contacted Jack Bass um, and Stuart Springer, who was the lab manager at the Jack Bass Zoological Research Supply Company in Englewood, Florida. The problem is with uh, the speed limit and the types of cars that were produced at the time, this was about a six hour drive, uh, including by bus uh, from Gainesville. So this was a, quite a distance, quite a separation. Um, nonetheless, Archie and Marjorie Carr, or Harris rather, uh, decided that what the best solution to their problem was to elope to the Everglades. Um, in this picture, this was actually a troth pledging ceremony. So for about four months, when Marjorie was working at the uh, Jack Bass Zoological Research Supply Lab, she concealed her marriage because if her boss found out she was married to Archie Carr, she would lose her job. During the Great Depression, uh, even when a, a teacher was working, and a teacher was working in a, a, a job coded feminine, right, associated with women, women teachers were expected to, quote, retire upon marriage despite their age because a uh, teaching job became valuable during the Depression. The same thing held true for scientists. Marriage was considered professional suicide for a female scientists in most cases. So Marjorie with, uh, withheld the truth about their relationship until Archie completed his dissertation at the University of Florida and they announced their marriage through this troth pledging ceremony at the um, Jack Bass lab. Um, their, uh, after their elopement, however, their uh, um, a honeymoon, so to say, um, Archie Carr uh, and now Marjorie Carr went back to Marjorie's mother's house um, in the Fort Myers area. And it was about two in the morning. Um, and they had, again, they had eloped to the Everglades to get married. Uh, Marjorie's mother lectured them on the perils of going out to look at the moonlight uh, at night when you're in love. So Archie slept on the couch and Marjorie went to bed with her mother on the first night of their honeymoon. On the next two nights, they traveled to the Tin Can Tourist Camp in Gainesville. Pictured here, if you were to look carefully, you would see a mixture of early automobiles and horse-drawn and even mule-drawn wagons. Um, this was the site in this picture of what would become later the county's first hospital, Alachua County Hospital, which later became Alachua General Hospital, which is where I was born. It has since been demolished and is now the University of Florida Innovation Hub. Uh, but tin can tourists have come back in popularity, especially in Florida lore. In this picture, uh, which was on the cover of my book, 
you see Luther Goldman on the left holding a rattlesnake and again, Marjorie on the right uh, hold, holding the um, uh, blue indigo snake. Her daughter Mimi would point out how gently she's holding the snake. She loved her job. She was responsible for collecting anything from cockroaches to alligators, preserving the specimens and then shipping them up north to universities to be studied. Um, so through this work, she was engaging more in um, zoological science and she had to fight off Jack Bass's desire to make her a secretary. In fact, in her letters that these for about a half year, Archie and Marjorie wrote each other at least once a day, sometimes telegrammed as well. And um, in their letters, there's evidence that Marjorie had to fight off um, these midnight dictation uh, sessions, right? Where Jack Bass would knock on her door when she was in her nightgown and ask her to come take dictation. I'm not gonna make any jokes about any New York go governors at the moment. We're gonna go to the next slide. Um, fast forward in time, we're going to Honduras. So Marjorie and Archie were married. They were happy, young and in love. They had their first child, Mimi, um, named for Marjorie. Her name is Marjorie Carr. Their second child, Archie Carr III, uh, who also goes by Chuck. Uh, when, when Chuck was just a couple weeks old and Mimi was two years old, Marjorie rode with them on a puddle hopper airplane down to Honduras where Archie had been hired at an agricultural school and he had only two classes per semester to teach, which is an, a really good schedule. And the rest of the time he was able to conduct research. He was determined to become the world's sea turtle man. And he pioneered the field of sea turtle conservation biology and tested some theories about sea turtle migration um, inspired through his work um, in Honduras at the school. What this meant for Marjorie was that instead of being relegated to um, a secretarial position, right, or not being able to find, find employment because of having um, a young family, Marjorie was able to work as an ornithologist. She accompanied Archie and often visiting guests into the cloud forest. And at the time, scientists study birds by shooting them and preserving their skins. As horrifying as that might sound today, and I own, I have a pet macaw, he's 23 years old. I think maybe he owns me, but it is horrifying to me that this is what they did. This is what was done at the time to, uh, to make observations about species and to document their existence in a certain field at a time when these birds were abundant. Um, thousands of bird skins that Marjorie Carr produced while she was in Honduras are in the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, the American Museum of Natural History, uh, and other repositories, including at Harvard. Um, so this is Tina, who was a nanny for Mimi on the right and Chuck on the left, and then two more children who Marjorie gave birth to while she was in Honduras. They were there about four and a half years. And you can see here that the children are dining by candelabra. So uh, this was a really good setup for Archie and Marjorie, right? Archie again had a light teaching schedule and could spend time conducting his own research and collecting. And Marjorie also was able to do her research into uh, birds in Honduras and collect. And she later published her findings um, in, in, in a letter home to her mother, she wrote that this was the best life they had ever led. They realized what an unusual opportunity it was. They had a nanny, a cook, um, a maid, a gardener. Um, she wrote her mother about how she would go off uh, a horse uh, collecting with her and exploring the cloud forest with Archie during the day, come home uh, by six, find the children bathed and, and fed and asleep in bed, uh, fresh soup and bread waiting for them and the clothes cleaned and ironed. Um, in this picture, you can see Marjorie on the right and she's using German dissecting tools to stuff cotton into the birds' bodies until it came out of their eyes. And you can actually um, see Mimi uh, here at the bottom right and Chuck on the left. This is one of Mimi's first memories, uh, watching her mother uh, do this repeatedly, right? She preserves thousands of bird specimens this way. And on the left is J.C. Dickinson, who later became director of the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. <clears throat> now, when World War II had ended and the cars came home to Gainesville, 
um, Archie was promoted to graduate research professor. Um, Marjorie had no family nearby. She no longer had a cook, a nanny, uh, um, a gardener, um, a laundress. And the family um, built their own home in Micanopy so that they could be away from things and so that the home could be more of a nature retreat to inspire Archie's writing. He wrote several uh, multiple books, award-winning books uh, that are wonderful pieces of Florida history. Um, so they had over 200 acres in Micanopy, which is so small that if you visit still today, there's only one stoplight and it's just a flashing red light and yellow on the other side. Um, in this picture, you can see something preserved in part because of Marjorie Carr's activism. So a fifth child was born in Micanopy. And after he, David, was um, school age, Marjorie was free to become involved in volunteer activities that would be um, acceptable for a woman in the 1950s. She couldn't find employment as in the sciences, but she, uh, she started to become active in town beautification. So sure, uh, she argued in front of the Micanopy town elders that they should preserve a thousand live oak trees. And by doing so, she helped to preserve these turn of the 20th century buildings that now are antique stores. The building pictured here is actually the Thrasher Warehouse, which was moved here later and is now the site of the Micanopy Historical Society. In this picture from the Matheson History Museum, you could see the um, uh, snowbirds who came down to Alachua County in the late 1800s. And this is actually Alachua Lake, which is the name for Payne's Prairie when in one of its, uh, one of its natural states, um, it is covered in water like a lake. <clears throat> and you can see, if you look very carefully, the women dressed in white have black chokers, almost like a Manet painting if the women were clothed. Um, here we could see buffalo. So Payne's Prairie is a unique stretch of land that is between Micanopy and Gainesville. So Marjorie and Archie Carr drove through Payne's Prairie anytime they went to town. Um, when uh, this, at the time they lived in Micanopy in the 1950s, late 1940s, all of this land was in private hands. It had been the Camp family for generations. Marjorie worked through the Gainesville Garden Club to convince the state of Florida to purchase this land from the camps and to create Paynes Prairie State Park and preserve. Um, and at the time that that was accomplished, after about a decade's worth of activism, it was decided that the prairie should be returned to conditions as much as possible, like what existed at the time that William Bartram came in the 1770s. So buffalo were reintroduced from the West um, and uh, Payne's Parade to this day is a beautiful stretch of old Florida. Um, now I see in the question and uh, answer, um, what is left of their home in Micanopy that photo is the historical museum now. Yes, that was not their home. That's the Thrasher Warehouse. But that's a good question about the Carr's um, home. So part of what motivated Marjorie Carr to become an activist, to go beyond town beautification and move into land preservation, like working to create Paynes Prairie Preserve and State Park, was that when I-75 went through North Florida, it literally went through the car's backyard. So their 200 acre homestead was divided. And to this day, I-75 cuts through their home, through their property, not through their house. And I have visited and it sounds like the constant roar of the ocean, except it's not the pleasant sound of waves. It's the, it's the unpleasant sound of uh, incessant traffic. But this, drove Marjorie to become involved in other battles to prevent similar road projects. Now, her goal, she later said, was not to prevent having a, a way to get from here to there, but to prevent having three different ways to get from here to there while cutting across environmentally sensitive land. So at Payne's Prairie in the 1920s, US 441 was constructed through the prairie. Later, it was um, uh, expanded from single lanes on either side to double lanes. And Archie wrote about the impact of that on the environment. 
There's a wonderful essay in his book, A Florida Naturalist, a naturalist in Florida, called The Bird and the Behemoth. And Marjorie edited this book after Archie had died and she was able um, to make sense of his notes. Um, and it's a beautiful piece. I highly recommend it, The Bird and the Behemoth. And it's in um, A Naturalist in Florida. Um, and you can still find it um, at libraries and online. Um, so that one road had gone through, right? 441 uh, and it had been expanded and, and there was an impact on the snake population in particular, which Archie Carr as a herpetologist was interested in. But then I-75 became a second major highway to go through the prairie. Um, and this had an even greater toll on wildlife. Today, there's an eco passage that helps to allow uh, snakes and um, uh, fish when it's wet and other things to go under the road. But in the 1980s, a third major highway was proposed that would have gone, uh, could have gone across Payne's Prairie. And this would have been a turnpike from Tampa to Jacksonville. Um, the interesting thing is that this project continues to rear its head. A few years ago, it was billed as I-75 relief. And uh, to this day, uh, there are continued battles, right, to connect these, um, these, these different highways and build a super highway. And the, the current argument that seems to have been successful is that because of hurricanes, you need a more efficient way to get out. Again, Marjorie Carr was not opposed to roads. She was opposed to having multiple highways going uh, through the same stretch of environmentally sensitive land. Um, okay, I see another section in the Q&A. The name of Archie's book. That one is um, uh, A Naturalist in Florida. Let's see, right here. Um, a Naturalist in Florida, A Celebration of Eden. I just love this one. I have multiple copies. <laughs> I have them throughout the house because it's inspirational um, to start your day with uh, a little Archie Carr. Although he was a scientist, he started as an English major and he had a tremendous sense of humor. And he had a way of personifying the insects or the animals that he was writing about. And he would convey a powerful environmental message in such a way that it was also really fun to read. And his um, mentor, Thomas Barber, had a very, you know, if we don't save the Florida now, there'll be nothing left. That was his message over a century ago. Archie tried to craft that same message in a way that would be, uh, that would appeal to multiple audiences, right? Um, let's see, moving forward. At the same time that Marjorie Carr was working on the project to save Payne's Prairie, she also heard, and Arch Archie uh, heard that Lake Alice, which used to be known as Jonah's Pond on the University of Florida campus, was going to be drained, uh, partially drained, and a 2,000 car parking lot and four lane cross campus throughway was going to be built at the lake. Archie's students conducted research here. Um, unfortunately, at the time, UF didn't have a, a sewage plant treatment plant and the untreated effluent was pumped directly into the lake. You could see here a large um, algal bloom. Um, so, Without any public input, University of Florida and Florida Department of Transportation moved forward with this plan to drain, drain portions of the lake and build this 2,000 car parking lot and four lane cross campus throughway. Um, due to Marjorie Carr's influence and others, including Joe Little, a law professor at UF, Jack Kaufman, a zoology professor, they called for public hearings. And Marjorie used the power of the pen, but also the power of the phone. She would contact the editors of Florida's major papers. And the next thing you know, the St. Petersburg Times was writing about Lake Alice. This is a picture of Lake Alice today. It's um, the, a popular recreation site in Gainesville. People are married at a meditation chapel on site. There are memorial services. And there are back uh, condos and houses right across from the lake. One of the most uh, popular things to do if you're visiting Gainesville is to go down to Lake Alice at dusk and watch as hundreds of thousands of bats emerge from the houses and fly over the lake to eat insects. Now, at the same time that Marjorie Carr was working to save Paints Prairie and Lake Alice, her most famous battle was to save the Oklawaha River. Um, and what was threatening it was a project that dated back to the Great Depression. 
So this picture shows a bridge stanchion. You can actually find a series of bridge stanchions um, that are being taken over, reclaimed by nature um, at the Sh Santos Sheriff Station where 301, 441, and 27 uh, merge between Ocala and Bellevue in central Florida. So what happened here was that going back to the Spanish times, there, were, there was a view that there should be a way to cut across Florida to avoid going across the entire peninsula, including the dangerous tip where there were sh so many shipwrecks. Um, during World War II, there was congressional authorization to move forward with the ship canal. And the idea was that um, it, you know, it was somehow going to help with the, uh, the, the World War II effort. Um, when world, the United States actually entered World War II, this was, uh, there was no more funding for projects like this. So construction stopped. And that's why at the Santos Share Station, you have these uncompleted uh, bridge stanchions that would have gone over a canal. However, 20 years later, the project had remained authorized and congressional fund funding uh, was, was found. And in this case, the same plan, which was Route 13B, which in part would go over the Ocklawaha River, would, it would lead to a barge canal this time, that would um, use the river as a water source as the canal was carved and would move from the Atlantic to the Gulf Coast, providing a way to shorten the trip around Florida and, and create an inland waterway. Um, this is a US Army Corps of Engineers map from 1965. This was their view of Florida, right? So you see the Panhandle, which was a separate district is actually uh, is at the bottom of the map, right? It's not, no longer attached to Florida. Um, kind of interesting map making. Um, Route 13B is actually at the very um, top and other projects that were going on at the same time included the straightening of the Kissimmee Canal. Um, now I see uh, a chat, I, uh, Karen says she lives right down the road from these stanchions and there was a wonderful path with signage of the Cross Canal fiasco. Yes, thank you, Karen, gold star to you. There is, it's called the Cross Florida Ship Canal and you can park at the, at the share station and walk there, be prepared for spider webs and bugs, but it is an amazing Florida experience. I encourage you to take cameras. Um, and when uh, driving by, it's so hard to see the bridge stanchions that you could easily get into an automobile accident. You really wanna just pull over and walk around and take it in. Thank you, Karen. Um, so at the time that of 1965, right, where there's Everglades drainage, you have the straightening of the Kissimmee uh, River. There's also the construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. All these major projects affecting Florida's waterways across the state. This is a picture of an environmental impact statement. It was not the first, but it was an early environmental impact statement. And Marjorie Carr um, served as an editor. And more than that, she appealed to people's sense of doing what was morally right. Um, Jack Kaufman, who I mentioned before, who was involved with the effort to save uh, Lake Alice, um, Jack Kaufman had been playing football with his family and had run into a metal uh, field uh, uh, goal post and was hospitalized with a concussion. Marjorie Carr went to his, hotel, uh, his hospital room and asked him to read this early, a draft of the environmental impact statement because she had heard he was a good editor. <clears throat> well, because he had a concussion, he would start to read a paragraph, he later said in an interview. And by the end of the paragraph, he couldn't remember what he had just read and he'd have to go back to the beginning. That was Marjorie Carr's ability to get people to help with this project to save the Akalaha River for free, right? Some of the top experts in the field would work for her for free on this project. Um, so this environmental impact statement, when it was completed, was mailed to all the top newspapers. Um, and the Florida's papers went from being at the beginning of uh, Carr's efforts, along with um, the Alachua Audubon Society and the single issue organization she co-founded, Florida Defenders of, Defenders of the Environment. Um, that along with their, their efforts, right, they were able to shift public opinion and the newspapers went from primarily supporting the canal in Florida to Florida's papers primarily opposing it once they had the facts, right? That was Marjorie Carr's view. Give them the facts 
and they will make the right decision, they being Floridians, politicians. Um, now, in addition to the uh, changing the, the opinion of the public and the press, this information was part of what was needed for a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit. So Florida Defenders of the Environment worked with EDF, Environmental Defense Fund, to sue uh, to save the river on the grounds that it was worth saving in its own merit and that the uh, economic and, um, benefits of the barge canal were inflated and false. Um, Richard Nixon as president intervened and issued an executive order to stop construction of the canal. And the federal lawsuit was also successful. So Nixon often gets the credit Marjorie Carr happened to be a Democrat. So we don't know what she would have thought of a Republican getting credit for killing the canal, but either way, she was thrilled that the project had ended. Um, however, the project was one third complete and the authorization for the Barge Canal project remained. So another 20 year battle to deauthorize the canal was still ahead of Marjorie Carr and FDE after the canal construction was stopped. In this map, you can see part of the completed canal includes, and this is the most uh, controversial part of the canal, the uh, Rodman Dam, also known as George Kirkpatrick Dam. Um, and what we could see in this picture is that, right, the Akawaha is still not in its native state, its natural state, even though the canal project is defunct, right? It, the purpose of this large pool at the dam was to provide water to float the barges as they made their way across the canal. Because the canal wasn't completed, the, the dam does not serve a purpose. Up here in the top image, you could see in 1949, the unaltered Oklawaha and how it, it was a naturally winding narrow river. In the bottom right image, you can see the pool I'm referring to, the Rodman Pool, where the water was going to provide, um, uh, you know, be one set of um, uh, pools to float the barges um, along the set center of Florida. Um, today, with the canal still intact, there are several endangered species: the Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon, and the uh, manatee, uh, among others, that cannot navigate the the, the um, dam. Right, so they can't go up the Akawaha to the uh, St. John's River uh, like they would normally do. The water quality is also affected. If you'd like to know more about the, um, this project, right, the, the ongoing effort to free the Akawaha, I recommend you look at the, uh, there's a free movie, free documentary you could see called Lost Springs. You could see it at lostsprings.org. It was directed by Matt Keen. And it stars, among other people, Margaret Tolbert, who is the artist painting Cannon Springs in this picture. So every three to five years, the water levels at the dam are lowered because the artificially high level uh, leads to a lot of weeds that choke the, the pool. So when the water level is lowered, uh, there's a collection of springs that are normally hidden, right? You can't see them under the, the high waters. And they, the springs come back to life. And they even, there are even new shoots of cypress trees that you could start to see. So Lost Springs is a really artistic, magical way of looking at this process. So I invite you to look at it. Um, this is a picture I took during the last drawdown. And if you look carefully, you could see the, there's a water line where the trees are normally, the cypress trees are normally submerged uh, by several feet, right? Water that's several feet higher than the river's normal levels. So um, the effort to free the Akawaha is ongoing. Uh, should it be successful, maybe there will be a return to the days where steamers went up the Akawaha, uh, like the Hiawatha in this picture. Um, and I'd like to close on a positive note. Uh, Marjorie Carr was a very optimistic woman as she was um, in her later years and she knew her time was coming to a close. She said, it isn't too late to save the Akawaha. So thank you for listening. I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, 
I don't see any questions. Aha, that's all you have to say. Um, oh, thank you, Lisa. It's good to good to kind of see you, see you through the chat. Oh, Rebecca has uh, her hand raised. Okay. Um, what do we? Let, what does Rebecca ask? Can Rebecca speak? Can we hear from Rebecca? Um, I don't think so. Um, however, I can read her question, which is what is left of their home? Oh, no, no, that was the previous one. Sorry. I just typed a note in chat, not a question. Hmm. I do see a question from Andrew. What are the objections to removing the dam? And Rebecca, maybe you could put your question in the chat. That might be the easiest thing. So re re objections to removing the dam. Um, so it is a popular site where people like to go boating and fishing and uh, people catch bass there. So uh, one argument is that it's useful, right? That this pool of water is useful, that uh, people um, who live in the area like to go fishing there. The counter argument is that the fishing was better before the dam and that it would be better once it's restored. Marjorie Carr said um, at the time, and again, I, um, in terms of the power of the pen, she wrote op-eds, she wrote an essay published in the Florida Naturalist. Um, she, she wrote um, you know, regular letters to her constituents and to legislators. Her view was that because of all the lakes in the area, including Lake George and, and so many lakes that are in that area of, of North Central Florida, that it didn't make sense to tie up the river to produce an artificial artificial pool of water from which to fish. So, uh, but that is the, the main reason, right? There's a small but vocal group of enthusiasts who, um, who want it to stay the way it is. In the case of the canal's completion or the construction of the canal, the only reason it was stopped was federal intervention. So uh, it wasn't the state, it wasn't the county level, it was the federal lawsuit and also President Nixon in their intervention is what stopped construction. So in the more than half century since the dam was completed, it's, it's likely that federal intervention would be needed again to restore the river. I see, when did she die? Susan asks, when did she die? And what were her later years post Archie like? All right, it's another good question. Um, so uh, the, oh, there's some, a lot of good questions here. So she died in 1997 um, and her later years were all spent working, continuing to work to free the river that she loved. Mar Mimi Carr describes her parents' relationship in their later life as uh, driven, right? So we know from um, their love letters, uh, Mimi was so generous, she allowed me to read a half cent, I'm sorry, um, a half year's worth of love letters. And over time and with humidity, the love letters had actually, the envelopes had resealed. And I felt like a voyeur opening them carefully and reading these letters. They were so in love um, when they were young. Now that love continued, but as, as those of us who know who are in relationships, right? The love changes over time. And their love of Florida, I think it's fair to say, and their love of nature was equally strong. So their later years uh, were devoted uh, together and later for the decade after Archie had died before uh, Marjorie died, their time was devoted to saving turtles or to, and, and to educating about them or to saving Florida. So um, there's also a question, uh, let's see. Why did they, Rebecca asked, why did they go to the Everglades to get married? Um, I'm a little sorry in some senses that I didn't elope to the Everglades. What a magical, fun place. But it was more the fact that you know, Marjorie suffered this catastrophic job loss because she had done a good, a good job finding out on her own, on her own time, uh, the answer to a scientific question. A colleague, a male colleague took credit for it and her, her boss fired her. She later said in an interview that her boss was never comfortable having a female biologist on staff. So um, Archie was wrought, right? In his love letters, he's distraught. He's afraid that if he doesn't marry her right away, he will lose her to another man. And uh, he was depressed at the idea of losing her. 
Um, so they got married and the idea was that, you know, he, he couldn't support her yet, but that because they'd be married, then they would be together again in the future. And they most certainly were. Um, there's a lot of drama in the letters they would make. Uh, they make for good, very good reading, but they're not currently published. Uh, there, there are seg segments, there are excerpts that are in, in my book. Um, and I see, is there a house in Mickadopi still standing? It is. Uh, their homestead is still there. They're, the last time I was there, there were still um, some steers and uh, um, it was, it's just a beautiful place. But you, you hear all the traffic on I-75, right? It just doesn't stop. And she wound up um, later successfully opposing construction of both a third highway that would have potentially gone across Paines Prairie and the Lake Alice. Uh, throughway. So although that was tragic, right, losing part of her homestead to I-75, it motivated her to prevent that from happening in other parts of the world. And she, she once said, there's so much going on in the world, right? How do you pick a cause? And she decided to work on what was in her own backyard, right? She was from Boston. She grew up in Florida. She became a North Central Florida resident, and that was where her activism was centered. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Peggy, there's one um, comment in chat. Okay. I see um, Pam says, wish so much that she had lived longer and had been able to get the dam removed. I, of course, knew and worked with her for years. She was not to be denied when she wanted something. I said a sad goodbye to her when she moved into a small place in Gainesville. I was in tears as I left knowing that I would never see her again. Still miss her determination and focus on restoration of the Akawaha. Oh, Pam, thank you for that. That is a beautiful comment. And yes, it had to have been so hard to leave the Micanopy homestead, although they didn't sell it, and to move to Gainesville, where um, the, the condo is. And actually, her daughter Mimi lives there. So Mimi was a successful Shakespearean trained actress who was out west and came back to Gainesville to care for her mother in her later years. And um, I actually met her there once. Um, Mimi directed me in, in a, a play and we were rehearsing at the house. And I had no idea when I very briefly met Marjorie Carr that I would wind up devoting years to telling her story, but it's an honor. Hey, that was wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you so very, very much. We really, are grateful that you spent this time with us this afternoon. Um, you know, the Historical Society is so committed to preserving uh, our, our portion of Marco Island's history. And, and thank you for sharing the broader uh, picture of Florida's history with us. So, so thank you. And um, we look forward to yet uh, other presentations coming from the Historical Society, courtesy of Florida Humanities. And um, please check our website and it will show you everything that we have yet to come. And should you be uh, so inclined, um, of course, any uh, help for the Historical Society to continue to present these really amazing Zoom in programs is always appreciated. So visit uh, the MIHS.org and you can always click to donate, but also check out our upcoming schedule. Thank you, Peggy. And Thank everybody have a great day. <laughs>